Hello, everyone, and welcome to the AWN Fuse FX panel discussion. My name is Dan Sardo, and it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Please join me in welcoming our two panelists. First, visual effects supervisor and the head of pipeline at Fuse FX New York, Ariel Altman. Ariel, pleasure to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you as well. And visual effects supervisor and the lead compositor at Fuse FX Los Angeles, Josh Miyagi. Josh, hello. Hi. Thanks for having me. Thanks for both of you for uh, joining us today. Looking forward to digging into some of the great work you guys have been busy with. So with that said, let's dive right in and get the discussion started. Do you see your role in visual effects production as more artistic, technical, or a healthy mix of both? Do you usually find opportunities to bring your personal creative touch to the projects? And if so, how do you, how do you make that happen? Um, I would definitely, say I fall into the camp of both. Um, I think that's what makes visual effects in our jobs so uh, interesting is that it's, uh, any given job might have a more technical bent and some jobs might have a more creative bent, but getting that mixture together um, and having, having both backgrounds to be able to bridge that gap a lot of the time Especially, we're not the ones as the effects supervisors, both I'm sure Josh and myself aren't always the ones touching the shots anymore. We're, we used to um, touch every single shot that we worked on, but now we're in the role of uh, being a creative and technical guide to our clients and our projects that we're working on. So we, we have to wear both hats. Um, the, and some of our, our partners are more technically creative technically um, uh, adept and some of them need more help. So I think it's always, a, it's always a fluid situation. You may not touch the projects like you used to, but your hand is still in it with regards to how you guide the artists who are working with you. So you, I would imagine you still have a, a considerable amount of opportunities to, to get your artistic touch onto things. Oh yeah, of course. It's it, it just it evolves. I think I think one of the interesting evolutions. I think this is not necessarily restricted to uh, our profession or any necessarily creative fields. Is that you as you grow and get in your career, you start doing a thing, and then you eventually get really good at doing that thing, and then people ask you to manage the people doing that thing, and those the skill of managing the people doing that thing isn't something that just happens naturally. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a new skill set that you have to learn. Um, of course, knowing how people do it, um, having done it before uh, helps inform how you guide them, of course. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a different types of hands, different kind of hands-on. I guess when I, when I say hands-on, it's, it's more literal, like, oh, I'm actually touching the mouse and doing the painting and things like that, but yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, Josh, what about for you? Well, I do think that there is, there has to be a healthy balance between creativity and technical aptitude when it comes to anything in visual effects. Um, because in the end, you are ending up with an artistic product. Uh, how you get there is kind of up for grabs, but it is an artistic endeavor. Um, I think I find more situations where I can be creative as a supervisor, as opposed to when I was um, like comp supervisor or compositor, um, because that's where you can sit down with sometimes the writers, the director, showrunners, you can sit down and all they'll tell you sometimes is, I don't know, we need a billboard. And the billboard's gonna go on the corner of Sunset and Vine. And from there, you can creatively go into, you know, you can build a billboard, what kind of billboard, how old is it, all that kind of fun stuff. And then you become part of the team that way. And that helps me with my creative outlet. Um, I, I also find that finding new, interesting and unique ways to do effects, more streamlined um, is creative for me as well. A few years ago, I, I was the comp supervisor on OJ for the American Crime Story OJ with Cuba Gooding Jr. And we had, 20 or 30 monitor comps in that, in that episode, which doesn't sound exciting, but it took place in 1997. So it's all those old CRT tube TVs. 
And what we ended up doing was going on Craigslist, buying an old CRT TV, taking all the fills that we got from the client, running them through a VHS VCR player, playing them on the TV, and then shooting the TV as a new element. And for me, that kind of streamlined process, that way all of our TVs look the same. It, it all, and it, it works great. And also you're not gonna get that sort of look unless you're actually kind of shooting a TV. So it's those sort of things, those sort of outlets that I really look forward to in, um, in being a, a VFX supervisor. Josh, we're gonna stay with you uh, mm -hmm. for this next question. You've worked on some projects that have what we'll generously call a small VFX budget, like HBO's Barry. How do you achieve such great looking visuals with such a small amount of money? What kind of compromises do you need to make to get the visual effects done on budget and on time on a show like that? I think it's interesting you put it that way because I never see it as compromising. There, I don't think you should compromise because all of our clients are, they might have more effects, more involved effects, but at the end of the day, they're, they're spending the same day rate as you know somebody that has a $3 million budget per episode. So compromise is not something that I like to do. What that means though, is going out, working outside of the box, thinking outside of the box of how you can cut costs and how, what new techniques can you use to help get the same effect without having to spend five days on a shot. We did a lot of that in Barry. One of the things we did is um, the last episode of season two, Barry is in this show, the showcase with his um, uh, kids in his acting class. And he, he walks out on stage and we shot this theater in downtown LA 600, 700 seats, and they could only afford 30 extras. So we had to fill the seat, but budget-wise, they could only get a permit and only get that location for one day. So shooting tiles was not an option because we would have spent, I mean, half the episode takes there, so it takes place there. So we would have spent, um, we would have spent more than half the day just shooting tiles and not even get to the actors or the performances. So we needed to come up with a way and what I ended up doing was um, I took five or six small little black magic uh, micro cinema cameras, put them, uh, sat extras. We worked with production to get extras in, um, in costume and wardrobe and props. They met us. Uh, on a green screen stage, we, I mean, the green screen, green screen stage, it was, it was a five by 10 green screen. Um, and we shot them individually with all six cameras at once. And what that gave us was the dead on, the angle, the 45 angle, and then the, the I'm sorry, the lower ones looking up so that we can put those people in the balcony. We did that. And then um, we put it all through a particle system in Nuke. We, we wrote a particle system based on the actual geography of the seats in the theater, built out the grid, and we just populated it. And uh, we kicked out 30 shots in about a week using that technique. And But that's something where if they have time and the budget, like you can get into doing um, massive or crowd sims and you know, motion capture and things like that. But, you know, you, you gotta, um, where you have full control over lighting and all that sort of stuff. But for something like this, it looked great. You would never know there were VFX shots and we did it for a quarter of the budget, I would say. So, so it's fair to say that sometimes that, you know, a budget constraint actually provides the challenge to get you to come up with creative solutions that you might not necessarily look towards if you had a much bigger budget to work with. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I, I go back to, I mean, we're all nerds here. We, we all grew up watching Star Wars. Uh, we, we know the deal with A New Hope is that Lucas had no money, he had no budget, but some of the best parts of that movie came out from the innovation of not having the budget to do it the way you wanna do it. So somebody comes to me and says, 
Um, and that kind of sticks in the back of my head a lot. Somebody comes to me and says, we, we need to do a CG, blah, 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 blah. You know, what, what is, you know, name the effect. My first thought is, well, I've worked with you client for a year now. I know what you average per episode. There's no way you're gonna be able to pour that in CG, but let's get you the same exact thing in a different way. And, and it kind of goes from there. I, it's, it's troubleshooting and it's problem solving, but that's part of the creativity of the job that I like. Um, Ariel, this is directed at you. You worked on the show, I Know This Much Is True, which features not one, but two Mark Ruffalos. How did you achieve such a smooth, seamless integration of the twin Ruffalos in all those shots? Did you use uh, full digital doubles? Did you use facial replacement, a combination? What can you share about how you put those two together on the screen um, across all, 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 all of those minutes? Yeah, I mean, I want to start off saying that I was the Fuse and myself are just one part of the team that was on that show. Uh, it was a very challenging uh, show. It was led by the client side supervisor, uh, Eric Pascarelli, who has a very deep background in motion control um, and visual effects in general. Um, and the, the challenge with that show started with um, something that seems Rel relatively uh, simple to do is like, okay, well, we have an actor that's going to play two roles. Let's just do a lot of split screens. We'll, you know, control the camera motion, uh, maybe do lock offs, and we'll just have some switch wardrobes and then play both sides of the scene. But um, the thing is, Mark's performances had to be distanced by uh, several months. Uh, the main Mark Ruffalo character that the, the, the the, one that the story follows a little bit more closely, was shot first. Uh, and then his brother is, uh, it has some mental conditions that have sort of forked his life. Uh, and he is, he's a little bit pudgier, his hair is different. He's, he, he, life has treated him much more profoundly in a physical way. Um, so Mark went away and he got Put on weight, uh, he got into character. So we have these splits, what started off as simple split screens potentially became very, very difficult with when you take into account that you have to go back to that same location three months later, make sure that it looks exactly the same as it did before, lighting the same, sets the same, um, and get that camera right in the same spot again. Um, and we came up with this uh, very, good system or rule of thumb, the, the camera head that was used on all of the twinning shots was always the same camera head. Um, and we were had a laser disto measurement um, attached to that camera head. And we were able to triangulate the features that were in the space, uh, take reference photographs and measurements of that camera position. So we could zero in on that camera position when we had to come back to it. Um, and it got us 99% of the, the way there for many of the shots. Um, there were also um, motion control shots uh, where we would not three dimensions of uh, or, or more of motion, just two axes, uh, pan and tilt uh, for those things. Um, there were some digi face replacements, but not very many. Um, some 2D face replacements, not very many. Um, but the interesting thing about that show was that it re really benefited from having uh, experienced visual effects supervisors on set that had experience with any number of solutions because the scene and the needs of the, the performance came first. Uh, so we would have to come up with the solution on the fly. Some of them were planned ahead of time. Some of them were creatively uh, solved on set on the day. It was it was fantastic, actually. I mean, it's very challenging, a little hair pulling here and there. And on top of that, it was all shot in film, by the way. So you still had to deal with uh, 
these little things that make split screens simple now uh, that make split screens imperfect in the film world or you have film weave and grain structure and the, the gates lining up and all sorts of things like that. That was, it was a very meticulous show to work on um, to say the least. <laughs> all sorts of fun things to contend yeah. with. Yeah. This one is uh, uh, directed to both of you and Josh, we'll start with you. We've been in a pandemic for close to one year now, which hopefully is coming to an end here soon. How have you each adjusted to producing visual effects from home? Honestly, it's been both bad and good. Um, <clears throat> so I do like working from home. Um, the, the biggest thing is the, right now is the COVID test for getting on set. Um, it, it is, you have rules per studio and then rules per production. So um, that means that, uh, for instance, uh, a couple weeks ago, um, I had five COVID tests in one day. And that was just because I needed baseline for, and it, one was at Universal, the other one was at Warner Brothers, another one was at HBO. And then, um, it, and what happens is, is that you, it, it just becomes part of your day because uh, you have to keep your baseline going for each production. You got to do that once a week. And then every time you're on set, you got to go in again and get tested. So the, the testing has been the big thing. Um, I, do, I, I do end up shooting. I like shooting a lot of my own elements for the show that I'm working on. Um, that's been great because I have a little studio in my garage and my backyard where I can set something up really quick. Somebody's like, oh, um, I was working on an episode of 911 right when the pandemic started when we we're all working from home. And they were like, hey, we need a hose, a water hose element for one of the, um, uh, one of the firefighters. So, you know, I, I went out and shot five or six elements with my pressure washer over black. Took me about half an hour and then dropped them in and it was great. I mean, that's the sort of thing that that's good about working from home. Um, but I, I, on the supervisor level, I am missing the contact with the artists. I, I'm missing being able to go over to their desk when I'm in the office and, and say, you know, let's figure this out together. Let's, but sitting there and working with somebody face to face, that's the thing I'm missing right now. That's been the toughest thing. It is a community in the office. Um, you know, th there are times when um, some of my supervisors are some of my good friends, and I feel totally comfortable going over to them and being, "Hey, we're having trouble with this shot. Can you take a look at it for two minutes?" Or, "Hey, have you ever done something like this? I haven't done this before. Can you talk me through it?" That's the sort of stuff that I'm th that I'm missing is the community aspect. Certainly, there's no substitute for that. You know, we we work around it but there certainly is no substitute for it. Ariel, what about for you? How's it been for you? There are certain things, I mean, overall, it's worse, right? Like it's not ideal. Like we're, 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 we're physical beings that are conditioned and biologically and socially to want to be together and, and communicate uh, in person. Uh, so all the mediations uh, that are required and all the hoops that we have to jump through to even get to a space like on set to be able to be physically close to someone is is challenging and it's a it's an obstacle. Um, there are certain things that are kind of interesting about uh, working from home that that have been a little bit advantageous. Before you had to physically for there's people like Josh and I like who you know even when we're in the office or even before COVID, we were in and out of the office because we'd be on set, we'd be back in the office. Now uh, we're in this mode where everyone's going through mediated systems like Zoom or uh, we use Microsoft Teams, um, we use uh, for reviews, we use Soho and NetClearView or on Teams or screen shares, all sorts of different things. Um, but because everyone's used to this mode of mediation and communication, uh, it's actually in a way, uh, a little easier to maintain that a level of contact with all your team members and your, 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 the people that traditionally were back at the studio when you're on set. So I can be on set now. And if I have a good enough connection, I can 
review shots in a very similar way that I do when I'm home sitting at my desk. Um, I can, uh, whereas before I'd have to walk over to someone's desk to work something out together, I can say, oh, just share your screen. And I can be out in my car, I can be out in the middle of a field somewhere. And so there are certain things that happen that I think, and, and will carry on into our post COVID world uh, that I think we've learned. It, make, it made me realize how much we relied on the spontaneity and unplanned interactions on a day-to-day, minute-to-minute basis. And now I am very much more conscious of who I talk to and when I talk to. And if I'm having group conversations with people, who's in that group, it's still not ideal. It's not, it's not, it's not organic or natural necessarily. But I think actually at the end of the day, and once we get out of this, um, it's actually making me a better manager. Coming from the artist side, as opposed to a producer side things, like I don't naturally say like, okay, I'm gonna organize my entire calendar today. My inbox is always gonna be a mess, no matter how many times I try. <laughs> but uh, now I have been forced to learn how to live by my calendar, live by my appointments, make sure people are in the, meeting up with me and with each other in the way that will be most effective. And I'm, I have to be much more conscious about those communications and creating that, what used to be a spontaneous creative space, a intentional creative space. Uh, so I'm trying to, you know, learn from it, I guess, this was, <laughs> to sum it all up. <laughs> we kind of have to. Um, certainly being deliberate about all these things makes you appreciate those skills that you may have taken for granted just as far as communicating with folks on your team. Um, Ariel, this is directed at you. We've seen in your great work on Mr. Robot that you've become quite skilled in one shots. Tell us what goes into producing the perfect one shot. Mr. Robot episode five was presented as one continuous shot in which we contributed over 40 seamless edits. The stitch was one of the most complex. The camera alignment on set was especially challenging due to the confined space and the transition from crane to steady cam. It was not possible to get the cameras into the same position for both takes. The solution involved match moving both cameras for both takes and creating a new virtual camera that blended the two together along with timing adjustments of each. The more time that gets put into the front end, the better the result's gonna be and the, and the more time you put into planning it, the more you're able to roll with the unexpected, which will happen. Um, but uh, it's a, having a combination of uh, partners from the pre-production, production, all the way through post-production stage, being all on the same page about what the plan is, what the, what the toolbox that you have available to you is, and then being able to execute and adapt those tools as things change inevitably um, is, is really it. I mean, because I think anyone, what anyone, I, I'm sure all of us and anyone doing a very short amount of research into one shot or like the illusion of one shot uh, um, shots, um, the, the techniques are fairly basic. Like you have, you have match cuts or wipes and uh, you know, like things like that. You have, you have devices that get you in and out of spaces and things like that. Um, and it's really just about uh, making sure that the choreography, uh, and this is where you have to just coordinate with the production to a very high level uh, is giving you those opportunities, uh, especially if there's gonna be variables going in from coming in from set that either from performance or from other types of restrictions that you wanna make sure that the techniques are fairly basic and simple, um, but the implementation is the challenge and the, the planning is the challenge. Uh, and for episodic, it's, it's doubly, I think, exacerbated because most, most television shows come from a production model that is you know, couched in um, network TV schedules where like, you have 
a week of, to prep an episode or maybe a little bit more and then you shoot for a week and a half or something like that and you just roll on to the next one. It's not a feature type of approach where you might prep for months and months and months and then you shoot for a month or two or three. Uh, the planning in, that goes into episodic work uh, per episode is much reduced in that sense. Uh, they rely on patterns and, and, uh, and, and the rehashing the same sort of styles and things over and over again to kind of make up for the lack of uh, or the need to plan every single thing. Um, so building building the planning time is especially challenging and episodic. Um, but with streaming, it's getting better because there's longer schedules. Josh, I'm uh, jumping over to you. The automobile driving scenes in CBS's mom seem so completely ordinary to the untrained eye of a casual viewer. But in reality, there's a plenty of unseen visual effects involved. How is that work produced? How did you make it look so seamless? Tell us a little bit about that kind of uh, an unseen visual effects work that people don't even realize is is digital. You know, is a digital manipulation of of, of a live action uh, shoot. Yeah, I think this kind of piggybacks on what Ariel was just saying that the TV schedule is you know compressed. So. Um, when we end up on an episode of Mom um, or uh, Mike and Molly or Call Me Cat or any of these sitcoms that we work on, there, there's some things that sitcoms can't really do. And one of them is go out on location to shoot. It's very, very rare. So they do a lot of stuff green screen like the driving. The, the thing with the driving comps are that we average about 50 or 60 an episode. And that means that we have one episode that has 10 and then we have another episode that has 100. So it, how can we streamline this to make it look correct, right, and also good? First thing is driving plates, background plates. Um, with mom, we, we do work with another company but we do have our own driving rig, um, our 360 Omnicam. I uh, go anywhere in the country, we would shoot full 360 background plates. That's step number one. The next thing that we do is do, um, I, I like to do specialized um, reflection passes um, where uh, we find out the make and model of the car that we're gonna be shooting. We uh, go and purchase a 3D um, geometry for that car. Then we can, I, then I go out with a 360 cam shoot these specialized reflection plates, and then we can reflect the entire environment onto the sides of the car, the roof. And then we do treat the windshield separately. And the thing with the windshield is that that's where the actor's faces are. So we need really specific controls about when we can see people and not. Beyond that, I, I would say the two biggest things with the driving comps are the details, and the reflections. That's how you really help make it work. Um, and uh, you know, I'll throw a third one onto that too. Interactive light. If you can get the DP to help you out and throw some interactive light on the cast as they're shooting, that always helps. The thing is with reflections is that uh, I've seen shows that air, not naming names, where the reflections are going the wrong way on the car. And that nothing takes an, somebody out of a show more than seeing something, a visual effect that's wrong, that then you have to stare at for a three minute scene. So I, I do take a lot of care in the reflections. There's, um, uh, there, there's an old equation from high school that I use to make sure I'm getting the right area of the reflections, all that stuff. I measure the angles of the, of the uh, windshield so I know what, all that stuff. The other thing is with the details, I, I'm a stickler for the details on this. And the details are things that, that is um, counterintuitive to when you're trying to key or when you're trying to do um, an effect. And that is, I want reflections. I want natural reflections on the window on the green screen. I want dirt. I want spots on the windows and the glass. Like I want it to look like a real car. And the more you can do that, the more that sells it. Um, we also have passes of window dirt um, and, and smudges and haze that we put over everything um, in the end. But the more you can get that naturally on set, the better. 
I do push them sometimes that when we are doing day driving or night driving, that we schedule it to where we can go into the parking lot of Warner Brothers outside the stage and shoot it outside as opposed to on stage because it's a lot easier to get outside lighting to look like outside than on a stage. And then finally, the last thing we do, and this is kind of a client specific thing, but we deliver our final delivery on that show are multi-layer EXRs. And we give them every layer that when the client sits down in the color session with the colorist, they can dial in the comp the way that they want. I, I'm there with them and we kind of come up with a plan, but uh, we'll give them the hero, what we the way we think it should look. That'll be our RGB. Of course, we have an alpha, we have the matte because they want matte, so they color background different than the foreground. Then we have a window dirt pass, we have a reflections pass, we have a smudge plat pass, we have a haze pass, and then we have an exterior reflections, and that's everything that's not the windshield. Uh, so on the Da Vinci, you can then go in there and just, you have it in one take, everything there, you can dial it in the way you see fit. And that helps also keep the budget down for them because then we're not doing five versions because they want to dial in the reflect reflections. We're doing one version and then we can sit in the uh, color bay and dial it all in. This is directed to both of you. What advice would you give to aspiring visual effects professionals, either students or young artists looking for a career in visual effects? Ariel, why don't we start with you? Real world experience in the way lenses, optics, lighting, um, traditional media uh, perspective. It's all in knowing what the real world does and what how it behaves and knowing it better than the casual viewer and the casual um, lay person. Uh, there are a lot of things like reflections being and, and actually a very interesting example uh, about it's not intuitive necessarily for most people um, how a reflection should look through a lens, how it should move when your object is moving uh, in a reflected surface or how an object should look when the reflected surface itself is moving. Uh, curved surfaces are not also not at all intuitive about how reflections behave. Um, so the, the impulse is to, oh, I, I can't tell you how many shots, and DPs have done this too, where, and this is a really simple one, uh, they want to photograph a phone, they don't have the content for the screen yet, and they want uh, to go from the screen content to a reflection of some character or some story point in the phone. Uh, and they will focus on the phone surface, not remembering that the focusing on the phone surface will not get the reflection of that, whatever they want reflected, in there. So, and, and you, you only have to explain it once, usually. <laughs> like you have to think of it this way. How, what, how, how far did that light ray travel? How much did that, how far did that go? It went from the light source or whatever is being reflected to that reflective surface, that phone, which is flat in this case, and then bounced off that, that phone surface and then will hit your lens. The, those two distances combined is how far away that reflection is to the lens. So as far as depth of field, that's the distance that matters. If you focus on the edge of the phone, it's really, it's really fun, a little experiment to show students or anyone really, is that if you have a camera that has some focus control, focus on the edge of the phone screen, get that in focus and you realize, oh, I, I can't see what is being reflected in this because it's completely out of focus. And then you focus on the object that's being reflected and the phone's completely out of focus. And it didn't take that long to explain, but that's not something that most people think about. And it's, it's actually surprising to me how many times I've had to have this conversation even with, uh, with uh, um, people in production as well. Um, and then curved surfaces is a whole other thing. Um, curved surfaces, car paint, uh, it does not react the same way. Um, the way a reflection plays off a curved surface is not as I just described it on a phone. 
uh, oftentimes that curve will act as essentially a lens itself. So you have sharpening and just not on top of distortion, you have sharpening, um, all sorts of little characteristics like that. So it's all these little details about the way light behaves, uh, the way lenses observe things in the world that is really, really crucial to creating visuals that emulate that. Um, and, and knowing what, what gets you the most, gets you the furthest. You, you, you know, you could simulate everything to the nth degree, but knowing what the, has the biggest visual impact and that's gonna sell the shot and also make it look as believable as possible is, is like, is your goal. Like you're never, you're rarely gonna be able to hit every single tiny little mark, you know? Um, but if you know the big things and then you whittle down, then you can, you can get pretty close. Josh, what about for you? Talking about learning what the circle of confusion is, learning about focus distance, um, learning how just things react in the real world, I think is important. And that's why I like to do a lot of things by shooting. And, you know, sometimes we have, we're supposed to have a CG object falling. I'll shoot something falling and then track it and then take that data and put it on the CG object because, you know, we can simulate a fall, but is it really going to look like a fall? Um, I, I think the other thing, a couple of the other things to think about it is that the best visual effects are done when everybody is working together. And that means the director, the DP, special effects and visual effects, not everything can be solved with a computer. And I, I, I see a lot of artists kind of come through nowadays. They're like, oh yeah, we'll just paint that out and track it and do X, Y, and Z, X, Y, and Z. But in the end, it, it's just, it's not gonna look great. Um, I, I, I think you need to really know some of the techniques out there to really get a solid, um, a solid shot in the end. So I think that there's a, a lot of people out there who have uh, started out on their home computers like I, I did, and I'm sure a lot of other artists out there have. I started on my home computer and you end up doing everything for yourself then. Work with other people, like working with the DP and being able to get interactive light on the characters is gonna make your shot look 10 times better as opposed to trying to find a way to do it in, in post. Um, you have to be open to things like that and not be afraid to work with other people. I also think keeping up with um, current technologies, I think is a big one. You know, we, we've all done a lot of de-aging and face replacements and making people look younger, but techniques have moved forward in the last couple of years, staying up with that and learning and then trying it on your own and just experimenting, trying, you know, there's great stuff on, um, there's great tutorials on YouTube of just, you know, that I still go to like the other night, I, I, I couldn't remember how to do um, a UV camera project in Nuke on, and I, I was having a total brain fart and then I was, I just typed it in YouTube and there it is. So that, that to me is really using the resources that are at your fingertips, which is the internet. And there's so many great resources out there for a visual effects artist. And from my personal experience, green does not solve everything either. I have so many clients and even artists who are like, you know, you, we do a lot of um, limb removals a lot of leg and limb removals on shows. You know, somebody gets their arm ripped off and the rest of the season they have, you know, they're missing their arm. We do a lot of those and everyone, every client, everyone, I've done two dozen of these now. Every client has come to me and said, well, in Forrest Gump, they just put blue socks on Lieutenant Dan and they were able to do it. I'm like, well, it's, it's, there's more to it than that. And there's so many artists and clients that are, well, well why isn't it green? I can't do anything if it's not green. It's, and this goes down to, you know, if you want, if production feels better with a green sock on them, great. But it's not gonna really help us any in the end. Also, when it comes to monitors, and this is your future effects artists out there, you're gonna do a lot of monitor comps. You're gonna do a lot of muzzle flashes. The two pieces of advice that I'll give you that I learned far too late is that 
monitors should be shot off so you can keep the natural reflections in the room and just screen the fill over, screen or plus the fill over and you get a natural looking monitor that'll save you hours, hours of time of trying to make it look real. And then with muzzle flashes, make sure you track the, the muzzle of the gun for the frame before and the frame after because you wanna have motion blur on that muzzle flash. And that is my advice. But those last two things are things that I wish I knew and I wish I didn't have to fight with early in my career. Yeah, I think collaboration and like is, is really, and communication is really key. I mean, I think it's so, it's super fun and awesome that there are so many resources and, um, and, and, and technology and power available to uh, people now. Like, uh, you know, yeah, Blender is free, Fusion is free, to Resolve is free. And I recommend all these things for people getting started to le start learning things. But at the end of the day, filmmaking is what is, is one of those unique things as far as artistic and creative um, products that is, it, it can't be done by in a vacuum. I mean, it maybe it could be for some stuff, but, it, it, the large majority of it, it's a collaborative process. It's a, it's, a, it's a negotiated art. Like you have all these people that are experts in their fields and like really good at what they do. And they're all coming together with their own ideas. And it's that intermix and then that, that collaboration that makes things really, really wonderful. And what saddens me sometimes is the pool of people that get gravitate to visual effects may have a slight predisposition to sitting at home or sitting in front of their desk, headphones on, just concentrating on making something look really great. Um, but that's just, that's just the one part of that execution. You can't minimize or the value of how collaborative the work that we do is and how you go from, you can be a good artist and have a mastery of your tools but you can't be a great visual effects artist unless you're able to communicate with the people that you're working with. You know, it's almost like, you know, they, they, they talk about um, cops. Like when you become a cop, you know, the, the, the rookie cops like, well, where's my big case? Where's the interesting case of the, and you realize at some point that the majority of your day is going to be doing paperwork and writing tickets. Like the majority of your visual effects time is going to be monitor comps, reflection removals, muzzle flashes, not everything is gonna be, you know, Infinity War. You have, the expectation needs to be there that you're gonna be working on everything from removing a crew member that was accidentally in a shot to putting in a CG creature who's ripping somebody apart. Those two ends of the spectrum have to exist in visual effects. You can't have one without the other. Like it, those two things are, Every movie, every TV show is going to have at least the low-level stuff. So make sure that you're you get good at that low-level stuff. Okay. Yeah, because this that low-level stuff is the, the techniques and the skills you need to execute the low-level stuff are the same ones that you need to execute the big stuff. You still need the same eye. You still need the same attention to detail. You still need the same communication skills and. Um, your, the rapport that you have with your team and your clients it's the same stuff it's just it's just more of it and it's it might be it gets more complex in the number of people involved and the number of tools and techniques involved but it's that but it's all the coming together that makes it a bigger shot versus a smaller shot we've gotten to the point now in our discussion where we're gonna quickly riff through a number of questions where i'm looking for a one sentence you know, one sentence answer. We're gonna go back through, we're gonna start with uh, a, sh a short version of what we just asked you. So Josh, we're gonna start with you. Give me one sentence or so. What advice would you give to an aspiring VFX professional? If I had a piece of advice to give uh, an aspiring VFX artist, I absolutely would say uh, to take in as much information and knowledge that you can from all of the resources at your fingertips. Photography, uh, get to know it really well, if you can. Uh, and the next one would be, um, be ready to learn for the rest of your life and make sure that you're gonna like it, the learning part. <laughs>
What's your favorite film? Doesn't matter what type, what, what's your favorite film? I'm gonna choose a non-visual effects one. <laughs> uh, only because I, I was thinking about it the other day, um, Kicking and Screaming by Noah Baumbach. It, it got to me at a very um, opportune time. Uh, I think it was, it was a good one. Uh, visual effects one would be, I guess, 2001 Space Odyssey and um, Interstellar. Josh, what about you? Favorite film? Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, if you want a VFX answer, I'd say I just saw the original Jurassic Park the other night at a drive-in. And some of that still holds up. It really, really does. You know, Lord of the Rings? I still think Gollum is one of the best CG characters I've, I've seen. Can you point to any film where the visual effects just completely blew you away? Uh, original Star Wars, Young, New Hope, when I was young was, I mean, I know that's now considered more special effects, but it was the precursor. It's like the OG visual effect. Modern day, current day, um, I Christopher Nolan films, name any one of them. The visual effects are so hidden that they're so, it's so damn good. And then, but if you want something in your face, I think Thanos in Infinity War is a pretty, pretty damn good CG character, especially on some of the close-up shots. And you can see the little whiskers of hair on his chin and like old scars and like the 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 uh, um the pores and it all moves so well and that like I, I that's pretty damn good. That's pretty solid. I, I I'd say he's he's probably the best CG creature in the last 10 years. Ariel, what about you? Uh, yeah, aside from like the, you know, stand, the, the classics, uh, I think, um, and this is an example of something that, unfortunately, I, I recommend it to my past or to past people is uh, seeing gravity in IMAX 3D. And this is, it's hard because I actually don't really like seeing films in, in stereo, in stereo, generally. I don't think there are really many examples uh, of well executed stereo, not necessarily from a technical standpoint, but also a creative standpoint. I always ask the question is like, well, why is this in 3D? What is this? What is this? How is this making this film better? And, and, and how is this making this the version of the film I should see as opposed to the normal 2D version? But seeing gravity uh, not in the back row on a large IMAX stereo experience was amazing and unfortunately you can't do that right now <laughs> that movie w was one of the first movies where i one of the only movies really where i'm like that was made for 3d like that you cannot that movie will not have the impact or the sto storytelling capability that it has when you see it on your your tv at home if you could work with any director or artist on your dream project, who would it be? I mean, I, I'd go with my I'd go with my childhood hero of Spielberg. I mean, Chris Nolan nowadays is I think has been been killing it. Um, I, I'd love to get on to really, but, but what I like about both of them is that they're so open to visual effects, right? Like, you know. The, Christopher Nolan is open to visual effects, but doing it in, in a different, great way. I mean, the the reviews were mixed on Tenet, but the way they recranked the film, the, the film, the way they recranked the cameras and and did some of the reverse effects, I, it was revolutionary because not that the technology is new, but because it's just a new way that old technology is being used, and to find artists who are open to things like that that interests me because it, it becomes kind of revolutionary. Okay, Ariel, what about you? Yeah, I, Christopher Nolan would be fantastic just because the, the, the mix of the practical and the problem solving involved, this like, eh, yeah, tenant and inception, like just the, the planning that has to go involved. I would, have, I would love to be on a project that went to that level of detail 
in the planning process and then all the way through the execution, this sort of the singular vision of that needs that much attention to detail from the start. Um, yeah, that, that would be, I would, I would love that. Um, but also with gravity, like I'll, I'll say Alfonso Curran also. I don't know. <laughs> oh, Guillermo del Toro too. Yeah. That'd be a fun one. Gentlemen, looks like we've run out of time uh, today. And I, I'd like to thank both of you, Ariel and Josh, again, for joining us, sharing some of the great work you're doing and, and your insights on uh, kind of some, and, and digging into some of the details about, about why you, how, how and why you do what you do and the decisions that you make. Um, I'd also like to thank Impact 24 PR and Animation World Network for putting this panel together and to all of you for watching. So stay tuned for the final segment in this visual effects series that starts up in just a few minutes. <laughs>